presented panel, or I've also been told perhaps an interpretive dance. Um, so you'll definitely stay now. Maybe we should have them go last. Scott Casino, who is the CEO and co-founder of My Strength, and Dr. Sherry Dubister, who is the vice president for behavioral health and clinical programs at Anthem, and also one of ABHW's board members. And then finally, we'll end with Dr. Corey Lathan, who's the founder and CEO of Anthrotronics. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Ben Ziv. Ziv. Ziv, thank Ziv. you. Um, hi, everyone. I know it's late. Uh, a, a little bit of context for this work, especially as it pertains to mobile health. So I think we're all alive in an exceptionally exciting time because we are here to witness the fastest adoption of technology in human history, which is quite a thing. Um, so if you look at the UN's telecommunications estimates, if back in 2001 the estimates were at around a billion, slightly less mobile cellular, uh, uh, mobile cellular subscriptions worldwide, at the end of 2017 the estimates were that they exceed seven billion. That is phenomenal. That the public uh, health implications of something like that, of more people having access to a mobile phone on the planet than a working toilet is mind-boggling. <laughs> and so the question for someone like me who does research focusing on people with serious mental illness, people who are disenfranchised, people who have limited access to resources, do these numbers apply to them as well? People with schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorders, who are often at the fringes of society and don't have the same access uh, practically in any other area of functioning. And so the research that my team and I and others in the US and beyond have done has shown that absolutely these numbers apply to people with schizophrenia as well. Research that we conducted back in 2011 shows that 72% of people uh, who are Medicaid recipients with schizophrenia have a mobile phone. Recent research conducted in multiple regions shows that of the 86% these days of people with SMI with a mobile phone, about two thirds of them have a smartphone. So a device with computational capacities that can host apps. So that opens the doors to the, the, the intervention that I'll be talking about today. It's called Focus. It's really the product of years of development and design. It started off, if you remember Palm Pilots, uh, those early versions of smartphones uh, that could integrate prompting and data collection all in one um, over to basic texting, uh, delivered through a remote secure server to very early versions of smartphones to so the kinds of things that we have today which have audio video capabilities. So we started with a large survey of people with schizophrenia to identify their needs and the potential treatment targets. We spoke to practitioners who worked in the field with people with psychotic disorders. We spoke to leaders at community mental health centers to give us insights about the types of things that they're just not able to tackle with their person-delivered community based care, so the, 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 the problems that are still stragglers, that we're just not hitting in the right way. And so after a multidisciplinary effort working with programmers at Dartmouth University, Dartmouth College where I was based up until recently, and Northwestern, uh, we were able to develop a system that we tested in lab usability testing with people with schizophrenia, got feedback iterated more feedback, multiple cycles of this until we thought that we, we have something that is accessible, that is readable, that is engaging for people that are known to have neurocognitive impairments, right? So, so not only limited access to resources, but real functional impairments. So what we have in the focus system is a combination of several elements. There are three daily prompts, prompts meaning it'll take over your smartphone home screen and ask you whether you can engage with focus right now. Those are assigned at the beginning of treatment. The prompts are based on three of five possible treatment targets. Those targets are voices or auditory hallucinations, social functioning, medication use, sleep, which is direct feedback from those focus group earlier on. It is a major, major problem for people with psychopathology in general. And mood, which is really depression and anxiety. So those are the five viable targets. In addition to the daily prompts, Focus also has all the resources available on demand on the phone, regardless of internet connectivity. So it's a native application. Once it's on your device, you're good to go. And people are able to access this 24-7. And so um, 
A prompt looks a little bit like this. Focus will take over your home screen, ask whether you can check in right now. If the individual says yes, it'll immediately launch the assessment of that target area that was assigned for that window during the day. And in this case, Rachel, our patient, has asked, have you been bothered by voices today? Because she reported at baseline that she experiences auditory hallucinations. And so, uh, Rachel responds using the touchscreen, says that she's been moderately bothered, and Focus will immediately launch the follow-up cognitive assessment, right? Looking at the dysfunctional beliefs that might be associated with her experience of voices. And here some of the options are they can't be controlled, they know everything, they're powerful, they're unpleasant, or something else. These are all constructs taken from cognitive behavioral interventions for psychosis, common dysfunctional beliefs that people have about their voices. And so here, the patient says, I think they know everything. So focus immediately launches into a sequence of quick and dirty interventions. Voices may sound like they know everything, but they don't. Can you think of any time when the voices made a mistake? How about when the voices were sure something was going to happen, but didn't? So we're giving tools for experimentation here, checking uh, past experiences. If the voices got it wrong once, they probably don't know everything, right? Think about it. That's the written version. There's a parallel version of all the content of focus that is now displayed by a video. So either I or another clinician or actors either um, show how to engage in relaxation strategies, how to question your dysfunctional beliefs, or um, deliver sort of cheerleading uh, interventions, telling people that it's going to be okay to hang in there, to reach out to people in their community, anything from social skills training to very basic behavioral tailoring for how to take your meds. There's a, there's a back-end dashboard. We use it for re research. We make it available to the clinicians that work with us that summarizes all the use that the individual has had since their first day and the summary of the severity of their symptoms so we can chart changes over time and response rates. Once a week, uh, a support specialist will call the individual to check in if there are any technical difficulties or anything that they can help out and address in applying some of the, the focus skills to their day-to-day -day life. So when we tested focus with people who were middle-aged, had a high school education or less, um, the vast majority living with supports and uh, uh, receiving Medicaid benefits in Chicago, we found that uh, on average, on a month of deployment, participants used focus on 86% of the days that they had it. And both in the first week of deployment and the last week of deployment, they exceeded the number of prescribed prompts. Now, keep in mind, we don't incentivize use, so people can use it as much or as little as they want. And in fact, we found that two-thirds of their use is, in fact, on demand. The fact that it's available and installed on the device allowed people to use it whenever and wherever they need it the most. And that's the feedback that we received from people. In terms of usability and feasibility, post-study assessment showed us that most people would recommend focus to a friend. They didn't think it was complicated. They thought it was easy to use. If they had access to it, they would use it. It was interactive. They felt confident using it. The message was quite consistent, that very uh, laborious and, and, and time-intensive process of development really paid off. We created a tool that is certainly accessible and usable and engaging to people with schizophrenia. Clinical outcomes pre-post testing showed significant changes in psychosis and the positive symptoms of psychosis, so persecutory ideation and delusional beliefs, as measured by the pants, and in depression. Now, to contextualize this, the magnitude of effect that you're seeing here is comparable to what you get from successful clinic-based CBT for psychosis. And we were able to get it with an intervention um, that is a third of the, of the time and largely automated. We then uh, engaged in a multi-state implementation project showing that the patterns of use of focus mirror the kinds of patterns that we see in clinic-based care. Females engaged more than males, white patients engaged a, a little bit more than African American patients, older patients engaged young, slightly more than younger. These are exactly the patterns that we see for clinic-based care for people with schizophrenia. But by and large, over a six-month period, we were able to engage people over time. So the red line represents 44% of the sample that kept using focus in one form or another post-discharge from a psychiatric hospitalization for up to six months. 
We recently completed a randomized control trial, a comparative effectiveness trial, really looking at focus versus RAP, wellness recovery action planning. It's a uh, intervention that's administered in a group format at clinics. Um, and it's delivered by two facilitators with lived experience. It's about two hours every week. So we wanted to see whether, how does our mobile health intervention match against uh, what is considered state-of-the-art intervention for people with serious mental illness. And we found that there was no significant difference, there was no interaction effect, there was no significant difference between their uh, outcomes. And so uh, when we look at the data, we see that uh, both, we're, we're looking at changes within intervention arm, both produced small to medium effects when it comes to general psychopathology um, and to depression in a manner that was basically indistinguishable between them. There was a slight advantage on recovery assessment to wrap, but overall the changes were not significant across groups. So to summarize, we were able to accomplish something that a more time, labor, space, and logistically complex intervention like RAP does uh, using a mobile phone intervention and weekly calls delivered to the person to their home or their environment. I think I made it in the right amount of time. <laughs> All right, that's it. And if there are any questions, are we doing questions No, now? so sorry, I should have mentioned that at the beginning. We do have um, 15 minutes at the end where we'll take questions and answers. So if you don't mind writing it down and holding it till then, we'll appreciate it. Thanks for your attention, everyone. Scott, Mr. we'll Pratt. turn it over to you. Great, and we actually did have an interpretive dance ready, but an old college football injury ah. flared up this morning. The minute I said it, right? On, on all days, so we're, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna do that. If we could. Sorry Shift to over it. to, um, great, so we're gonna split the time. Um, I'm Scott Cousineau, the, the co-founder and CEO of MyStrength. Before I talk about what MyStrength is, we like to talk about the why. Um, so we formed the company, myself and a co-founder seven years ago, kind of an interesting convergence of personal and, and professional factors. Um, personally, I struggled with depression 25 years ago and was blessed uh, with loved ones who helped me overcome my initial stigma to seek out a therapist and had a life-changing outcome. Fast forward um, to my last career, I was scaling and leading an online university um, and really had a front row seat to what was happening in the higher ed space um, in regards to digitizing content and engaging consumers over a, a lengthy period of time. The use case for my strength, though, became very apparent when we were looking at our healthcare costs. I had a, an organization of 600 employees, and we were looking at our health risk assessments and our pharmaceutical Not unsurprising to this audience, behavioral health was well represented, stress, anxiety, um, substance abuse. And we invited our health insurer, which was not Anthem or Blue Cross, to come in and showcase tools around self-management um, in these behavioral health conditions. And what came back was a, what they called an innovative depression management program, which was a video and two static articles. Um, and as a technology company, um, we were saddened and shocked and ultimately perversely curious in terms of what was and was not happening within behavioral health and quickly came to conclude, um, and, and things are changing pretty rapidly, that, that while there had been tons of innovation on the medical side, behavioral health, um, was, was really lacking. And so with the blessings of our respective wives, we left what we were doing to create my strength with the mission of uh, developing interactive self-management tools that, that effectively serve two functions. First, as a self-management resource, and secondly, as a treatment extender, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I, I think to do this well, there's a range of competencies um, related to the delivery and the integration, and we've been very blessed and fortunate to bring together a range of clinical experts, health economics, managed care experts, along with some very important strategic partners, um, namely the National Council uh, for Behavioral Health, we're one of their seven strategic uh, partners. We can advance the slide. So as, uh, just a, a very brief orientation to the platform. What we try to do is take all of our learning around contemporary adult engagement um, and mix in contemporary user interfaces and, and design. But, but we knew from the beginning that the critical underpinning had to be evidence-based, um, uh, empirically-based models. And I think what's relatively unique about my strength is we've really tried to diversify uh, beyond cognitive behavioral therapy, which we know is a gold standard, to include other models 
um, such as mindfulness and motivational uh, interviewing. We then um, really tried to listen to the payers and providers that we were beginning to work with. And what we heard re repetitively was, we, we don't need point solutions. Um, we need the ability to have an integrated resource to offer our consumers. Um, and so we really set off on a journey to create a spectrum of interactive tools and resources ranging from stress, anxiety, depression, to most recently chronic pain, and soon um, insomnia. I think the other and perhaps even more important element is we know consumers oftentimes have these conditions simultaneously. In fact, 75% of our users, when they come into our, our resources, indicate that they're dealing with a couple conditions simultaneously. In addition to um, the, the core behavioral health, though, we wanted to think about holistic orientation, and so we've built in wellness resources, uniquely spiritual content, user-defined, uh, faith-specific, non-denominational. And the way that we kind of bundle this all together along with some social interaction is um, very sophisticated machine learning and learning algorithms. So every time a consumer comes in, we're continuing to understand their personal profile, what tools and resources um, lead to the greatest level of outcomes, as well as integrating in these interactive tools. So if I'm struggling with sleep and anxiety, they're gonna get a mixed set of resources and tools that could range from interactive uh, e-learning modules to in-the-moment meditation to a range of, of coping tools. Uh, Sherry's gonna talk about our experience with Anthem. We've been very fortunate to, to uh, partner with a range of different payers and providers who are seeking innovative, efficient tools to extend reach. Um, outside of the payers, we're working with large health systems, uh, particularly primary care, um, who really are on the front line of behavioral health and, if you will, kind of prescribing my strength in addition to other treatment modalities along with consumer platforms. Um, and then lastly, before I turn it over, um, we've been very fortunate to work in the public space, uh, 26 different states, Medicaid-funded providers who have integrated my strength in as treatment extenders. I think a couple really interesting use cases, Center for Mental Health, rural Colorado, have implemented a model where, because of the lack of clinicians that they have, they're testing 30 minutes of my strength and 30 minutes of a clinician. And we're testing that against a, tra a traditional face-to-face -face model. Um, Horizon in New York um, has begun to integrate my strength into their psychiatric hospitals um, and critically into the discharge planning. Um, also in that location, peers are a big resource, and so my strength has been introduced to really elevate up the peer capability. Um, and then lastly, uh, we just, uh, in the last year or so, launched across the entire state of Missouri, um, really in alignment with the certified community behavioral health model that's been rolled out that really helps to advance, um, I think, the flexibility of reimbursement around tools like, like my strength, and we're seeing some um, really wonderful and encouraging results in terms of engagement and, and, uh, and impact. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sherry. Great, thank you, Scott. If you could advance to the next slide, thank you. Um, so I think I was asked to present today, as, uh, as Henry put it, as kind of a user. And, um, and though I have actually used my strength as an individual, I'm here representing Anthem. And uh, for those who aren't familiar with Anthem, uh, we insure over 40 million uh, lives, where the Blues in 14 states and operate in uh, 20 Medicaid markets as well. And um, we take that responsibility quite seriously, uh, including uh, the importance of mental health parity, of course. Um, we began thinking about this space a few years ago, both from a, a way to bring in technology to improve access to behavioral health for conditions such as depression, anxiety, et cetera, but also because we were beginning to think about well-being in a broader way, and uh, emotional well-being is such an important component of uh, overall well-being. And so we did complete a market landscape and uh, got to know my strength and the kind of model that Scott was just walking through in terms of not siloing a person to uh, commit them to a whole track on depression or on anxiety, but to appreciate the fluidity that we all are as human beings and to have a technology that was nimble and responsive to that really appealed to us. And so we began with our own Anthem Associates uh, and did a pilot. This would have been in early 2014. 
And the excitement among our associates and the engagement was really strong. It was in the high single digits, which uh, is actually quite good for um, getting uptake of a digital tool. And so uh, even before the pilot was done, we had decided to incorporate my strength into, at the time, what is our uh, more buy-up behavioral health product. So we do medical, we do behavioral, we have range of specialty services, et cetera. And so we added my strength in as core to that, uh, that buy-up level level of behavioral health. We added it to EAP. Uh, this year we went live with it for Medicaid in the state of Washington, uh, soon to go live in Medicaid uh, DC market. And next year we'll be adding it over the course of the next 18 months really uh, as core to our full behavioral health membership. And so with that in mind, you know, we've kind of developed some mantras on how are we going to make this successful and what is uh, what are the challenges of of permeating this kind of tool uh, for broadly through our membership base. And the mantra that we've kind of developed is uh, promotion, awareness, and integration. And I was struck yesterday by uh, a focus on, uh, on curiosity. I thought that was a really a wonderful uh, label as well, and so I'm gonna add that to our mantra list. But uh, starting with promotion, I, I can't say enough about how important it is and that if, uh, a customer is, whether it's an employer or a health plan, a provider, uh, but if the notion is to sort of say, hey, the app is here, you know, go and use it, uh, I think that's a formula for extremely low traction and uptake. And so uh, we have spent a lot of time and we use our own associates as kind of the laboratory for uh, pushing uh, and really making awareness a key priority. And so for us, that means that if we are doing a webinar on stress or on uh, you know, anything to do with workplace health and well-being, we'll find ways of weaving in my strength. We'll do email campaigns, et cetera. I think there's a variety of ways to go about it. But when we've done those campaigns and when some of our large employers who have my strength as part of their solution have done it, we've seen upwards of 240, 250% increases in enrollment. And once you get enrollment, things get really quite good, as you'll see when we get to the next slide. But I, the awareness piece is critical, and it's not a one-time deal. I think the notion is that you have to keep at it. Um, the integration is also very important. We really didn't want to look at my strength as an asset that just sort of sat off on its side, you know, checklist, we have an app. Um, but how do we make it come alive as part of overall uh, programs that we have? And we have a, a, a big range of programs that support our members in times of need uh, with case managers and care managers and coordinators. And so we have uh, built the integration into the workflow for those care managers so that they expose our members to the tool, they can help onboard them if they need help, a little check-in depending on the progress as we're working with them more broadly. And I think that's really led to some exciting results in terms of not either or, but and, in terms of really leveraging uh, the, the technology. And if we go on to the next slide. Um, so with all this rollout and expansion, you know, we've obviously been very eager and the partnership with MyStrength has been great and, and truly a partnership uh, to start to understand well, how, what kind of impact are we seeing and how's it going. And so I spent some emphasis on the enrollment part, which again, you know, wouldn't want to underemphasize. But the cool thing is once we get them, the engagement is actually quite good. Um, uh, members and consumers uh, come back to the tool, they do multiple sessions, they do multiple activities within the session, all of which directionally suggest that something good is happening. Um, and really this slide is all about directional. Like you start adding up engagement, satisfaction. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our first pass at looking at effectiveness. And we have you know, come to a very comfortable interim kind of assessment that something good is happening here. From a satisfaction perspective, we fielded a consumer survey uh, just a few months ago and saw just great results in terms of the respondents saying that um, they value this, they're aware of it, and what I think is the most interesting is the relatedly that uh, it's improved their emotional well-being. And that is something that if you're an employer, if you're, uh, really from any vantage point, if you're a consumer yourself, uh, that notion of emotional well-being that this could contribute to that is really something we were hoping for and looking for. In terms of effectiveness, um, I would definitely call this a first pass of a collaboration between the Anthem Analytics team and the MyStrengths team 
to uh, use uh, an effect size methodology that compared my strength to uh, more or less a gold standard of outpatient therapy, uh, using the literature for the outpatient therapy piece, and then uh, using the metrics we collect with my strength. And the graph on the left shows, just in a general way, the lighter color is the depression scores uh, on initial assessment, and the blue curve shows uh, people on reassessment. And you can see, I mean, people still will have some depression, et cetera, but generally there's been a down push in terms of the severity of depression. I should note that we used people, uh, we enrolled people who uh, had moderate or severe depression on their initial scale. Uh, so as we worked together and said, well, what can we extract from this using this effect size methodology, we came to the uh, impression of my strength being about 80% as effective as outpatient therapy, and then went through a series of assumptions to draw some initial impressions as how would we translate that from a cost of care perspective and affordability perspective, and you can see the numbers there. Um, we have a lot to do here. We have a lot to do in terms of uh, getting more sophisticated in our abilities to understand uh, impact from my strength, um, and also in parallel to continue to improve the impact. And improving the impact for us involves a few things. It, of course, involves continuing to promote and increase awareness and uh, curiosity. Um, it includes building out additional capabilities, and, and Scott's going to go into a few more of those. And it includes deeper integration. So we tend to think of this as kind of an ecosystem of, uh, in this case, more behavioral health and well-being assets, if you will. And beyond just integrating into the care management workflows, we're now beginning to map out how do we tie this to our telehealth for behavioral health. We provide telehealth psychotherapy currently. We're adding psychiatry. How do we begin really in a consumer-centric way, design end-to-end -end solutions that account for consumer preference, acuity, uh, how they're responding uh, to one level of intervention or another? And I think that's really where the future is in terms of unlocking more and more value from these kinds of solutions. But I think we're off to a good start, and um, I'll hand it back to Scott to finish up. Right. Um, and so just very quickly to build on Sherry's comments in terms of efficacy and effectiveness, if we could advance the slide. Um, our belief is that um, epidemiology, randomized controlled trials, uh, health economics, and real world evidence all need to come together. And, and there's a range of different studies that we've done and will do going forward um, in each of those categories. The second was if there are folks in the audience that um, are engaged in research. Um, we have a, a, a very strong internal, uh, there we go, internal competency around health outcomes and economics, but we also have engaged a number of partners as we think about third-party evaluation, and um, we are uh, very um, eager and interested to talk to outside parties as well that share a similar passion for demonstrating effectiveness on, on multiple levels. So with that. I'll turn it back to Pam. Great, thank you. So I'm not I'm not sure what this is, but <laughs> I think we have two ad yeah, slides advancing here. Slides. But if we can advance to the next slide, please, next presentation. All right, Whew, wake up. Uh, so we'll do a little audience participation to wake us up. Um, how many of you have ever misplaced your car keys? Okay, how many of you have ever forgotten someone's name that you knew pretty well? Okay, so pretty much every one of us has done probably both of those things. So how do you know if that's normal or if you have early onset Alzheimer's? Well, I'm preaching to the choir, right? But, but the problem is that we don't because when it comes to quantifying our brain health, we pretty much have been ignoring the brain. Um, in fact, when we go to the doctor's office, they take your temperature, your blood pressure, your height, your weight. We obsessively track body mass index from the time you are born, but we do nothing to measure brain health. Well, I want to do three things today. I want to tell you about a brain vital that we developed for the military. I want to share some data that shows that this brain vital is a sensitive cognitive outcomes measure to many different conditions, and share a little bit about our vision for the future of brain health. 
So my background is in uh, neuroscience and aerospace engineering, and I'm the CEO of a biomedical engineering R&D company. We've, over the past 20 years, we've developed virtual reality for the International Space Station, robotics for kids with disabilities, instrumented gloves for surgical simulators. So when my military colleagues approached me and said, can you develop a mobile medical app for medics, I thought, great, piece of cake. What I didn't know is that it would turn out to be one of the most difficult things we've ever done, as well as potentially the most impactful. Um, and here's the problem they laid out. When our men and women are deployed, they experience conditions that cause combat fatigue and stress at the least. In addition, depression, PTSD, and blast injuries that can cause concussion. And the medics didn't have tools to help evaluate the service member's cognitive health um, or brain health. And so, um, they, uh, so what was happening is that soldiers were either being misdiagnosed or diagnoses were missed. And so we had all sorts of, of problems, including um, uh, epidemic of, of suicide in the military. So we were asked to give the medics tools that could help track a soldier's brain health over time and alert the medic if there were changes in their cognitive health um, and refer them to a higher level of care. So, oh, and by the way, we were told it had to be FDA cleared. Now, this was about five years ago before there were any guidelines for mobile medical apps and really no medical apps, very few medical apps out there. But that's another story, and we did it, and in, um, October of 2014, we were the first computerized cognitive assessment app to get FDA clearance, um, and we delivered Dana to the military, um, and it's now part of their uh, medical device portfolio. So fast forward, and let me tell you what Dana is. So Dana, it, what we did is we took Cognitive tests from the literature. Computerized cognitive testing has been around for 20 years. We didn't make stuff up. We took the best tests from the literature with our scientific advisory board, and we picked three cognitive tests. And if you're familiar with cognitive testing, it's like science-based game, you know, games, uh, scientifically valid brain games. And we took the tests that were most impervious to things like learning effects, um, to demographic differences, and we picked three, which became our brain vital. Simple reaction time, choice reaction time, and a go, no-go. And those became our brain-based performance biometric, and what we call the brain vital. We also have a larger battery, um, uh, which I can tell you about if you're interested. But really, the Dana brain vital is a very quick and simple method for capturing longitudinal cognitive biometrics in both in-clinic and telehealth applications. And I want to highlight some of the data that we've been collecting. And pretty much all of this data is published, so I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. It's just to give you an idea of the types of experiments we've been doing. Um, and I want to get to the more interesting story of uh, some of our new work with caregivers, uh, dementia caregivers. Um, so the first data was with um, uh, return to duty. This was deployed soldiers who had experienced concussion. The controls were uh, soldiers with orthopedic injuries. The controls are in blue at the top. Um, and as you can see, their performance is higher, and the green basically shows that, yes, we were sensitive to cognitive improvement on recovery um, of concussion. Another project we did with the military was a telehealth project with the Veterans Administration in Hawaii. They were looking at um, CBT therapy with veterans with PTSD. And so they were providing uh, CBT therapy, or I guess that's redundant, but CBT to uh, veterans remotely, and they were also taking Dana to look as well as the standard measure of PTSD, the PCLM. So the PCLM is a questionnaire that's reflective of PTSD. You can see that it's going down, meaning you have a lower score, so you have less PTSD, and you can see Dana performance is going up. And this was all done remotely, so there was no clinician in the loop except to look at the data. Um, and that was part of our FDA clearance that was also very novel, that we could, you can administer Dana remotely. It doesn't have to, you don't have to be in front of a clinician. 
Um, this is another military study with, um, it was actually a joint study with the US military and Australia, um, and it was convoy drivers. So this was a four day simulation, <laughs> convoy simulation, um, thank goodness, uh, that showed again that um, lapses or errors increased over the four days in the group that did not get caffeine. Um, This is a, a, a study that was just published by Johns Hopkins um, where the neurologist used Dana as a bedside assessment of cognition during electroconvulsive shock therapy for treatment of moderate to severe depression. The only other bedside tool he's ever been able to use is a mini mental exam. And as you can see, this is a, this is a, a sample patient, but this was very, very standard. Almost all the patients could score a 30 throughout ECT because they were highly educated, they had a lot of cognitive re reserve, um, but the problem was we know ECT was affecting their cognition, and so this gave him a sensitive and easy measure to look at was cognition getting better or getting worse or not being affected by ECT, and it can be either three. Um, so this was a great tool, and in fact, he loved the tool so much, he started using it with his other inpatients, anorexic patients. And he started using it to show them, and this is actually unpublished, um, but hopefully will be published soon, that as their body mass index improved, so did their cognitive health. So he was using it as a positive feedback to the patients themselves to say, hey, look, yes, you're getting better. Um, so that was just very dramatic for us, and, and actually now to think of Dana as an intervention as opposed to just an assessment. And that'll come back in, uh, the next study. Um, so you can imagine we were also asked to work with dementia patients. Um, that seemed like an obvious uh, population for a cognitive assessment tool. Well, um, we, were, it, we were funded by the Bright Focus Foundation to do a telehealth study with dementia patients over 90 days. So in order to do that kind of study, you need to have a caregiver who is also uh, opts into the study and is really kind of the proxy for the, the researcher in the study. Well, we could not find caregivers who tested normal on a cognitive test. So if you're familiar with human subjects research, they would come in, they would come into the clinic, the caregiver and the dementia patient, they would say, do you want to be in the study? Great, you both want to be in the study. Okay, caregiver, you need to take a mini mental test and its score in the normal range because we can't, if you're not cognitively able to, to understand what's going on, seven caregivers in a year of patient flow through a memory clinic could actually score in the normal range. So the talk, now when I talk to other people who've worked with dementia caregivers, they're like, well, of course, they're exposed to stress and fatigue. Caregivers aren't normal. It doesn't matter if they say they're healthy, they're not. So lots of you are saying, of course, I could have told you that. Well, I found that out empirically. Um, and this is just the data from the seven who actually scored, um, and the caregivers scored better than the Alzheimer's patients. Big whoop, so now we know Dana's sensitive to dementia, which I also could have told you before looking at the data. But so the interesting thing is that this made us switch gears to um, where we are now with our Healthy Brain Study. We've gone virtual. We launched the Healthy Brain Study website, um, health-ebrainstudy, I hope it might be on there. Um, but if you want, I can, I can definitely just let me know if you're interested. And we invited caregivers to our website, at dementia caregivers, and we got hundreds of dementia caregivers coming to the website, opting into a study where we evaluated their cognition, we evaluated their uh, mental behavioral health, and we've published the cross-sectional um, data of both of those. So we've shown that yes, compared to demographically matched controls, caregivers are cognitively impaired. Yes, they have high incidence of anxiety and depression and insomnia and other things. Where we are now is we're working with our clinical partner, Mindula, who does uh, virtual uh, clinical case management of patients with behavioral health problems, and we're using the Mindula intervention, and we're also using Dana as an intervention so that the caregivers have what we call a mobile mirror. They can help manage their own health. They can see that sleep's affecting 
their cognition. They can see the different things that affect their own health. So that's where we are now. We're in the middle of collecting that data. Ah, so yes, so wanted to just leave you with a few thoughts on the future of brain health. So I generate more data in a day than most doctors see in a year. You do too. And there's a word for this data that we're generating that's emerged. It's called a digital, your digital phenotype. Now, we've only just scratched the surface of using, mining this data for, for monitoring our health. Um, and we have a long way to go. But if we want to stay healthy, we need to quantify healthy. And so where I think it's going to go in the near future is a combination of active inputs, maybe like our brain vital, and a combination of passive inputs, uh, like your interaction with your smartphone or some EEG or EKG. Um, and, you know, it's, but it's going to go to a point where the future is going to be that we're going to actually passively be able to monitor a lot of our behaviors through the internet of things and people and understand our digital phenotype. And my goal is to investigate individual digital cognitive phenotypes to help with treatment, uh, with diagnosis and treatment, but also for wellness and prevention so that we all live healthier, happier lives. Thank you. Perfect. And nobody went over time, which I don't think has ever happened to me on a panel. So congratulations <laughs> to the four of you. So we do have time for questions and answers. Um, if you can just raise your hand if you have a question. Great. Right here. I have a question about uh, family members. If it goes into the caretakers, we've seen a lot of tools for the consumer to track their moves. Um, I work a lot with NAMI uh, people, and there's a lot of parents out there that would love some type of, or, and spouses that would love some type of tool to understand how their loved one is doing if they were willing to use it. But I was just wondering if there's any thoughts of going there to help family members. Um, I can start. So, a um, couple things. One, um, Centene through formerly Sympatico does a lot of work with foster kids. And um, they actually launched My Strength to the parents of the foster kids. So it was a very practical use case um, in terms of its current application. The second is um, we're incredibly excited about youth. Um, we've made a progressive step. We launched a, an app for college age students, and the next kind of venture for us is adolescence. Um, and likely we'll be partnering with one of the largest um, children's hospitals in the country. And what is critical for them, uh, and we've obviously begun to embrace, is the caregiver component as much as the child. So I think, at least for us, I think we're incredibly sensitive um, to that, particularly as well with aging parents and what's happening uh, in the demographic. So I, I think it's a great question, and at least for us, I think we're going to become more focused and more sensitive to that going forward. Do either of you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I completely agree with you. I think that's especially pertinent for families of, let's say, people with first episode psychosis, where it's not just support to the family for the sake of information sharing and creating a sense of community, but really the family members are often the first people to see that something is going uh, off the rails a little bit. Um, and so the family gaining access to resources and interacting with the potential patient can have real implications for the quality of care and the speed with which people will receive services. So I certainly think it's important. Um, I can tell you that at UW, so in addition to being a professor of psychiatry, I'm also the co-director of the Bright Center, which is the Behavioral Research in Technology and Engineering. And we're working with UW's first episode program exactly on that. And it's trying to create a digital platform for family members of people with psychosis, uh, recognizing that, that it is incredibly uh, important. So, so we're on it. Uh, we'll see what, what happens with it. But that, that's a very important point. Great. Yes, in the back. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is, um, I'm glad to start. You know, I think it depends on which workflow you're integrating into. So for our care managers, in behavioral health and our EAP, it was probably the easiest because it's a direct focus of what they're doing, so it becomes an augmentation. Training the medical teams to think about from a more, because we're all committed to holistic care management, but bringing that more to action and doing it in ways, though, that fit into uh, how they assess you know, members when they are interacting and, um, and how they are forming their care plans with with our members uh, and fitting that in in a way that feels like it's natural as opposed to another layer, another hoop is just critical. And that same principle as we go on the provider side, on the doctor side and begin to introduce tools, making it easy and making it so that it fits in, taking advantage of waiting room time, taking advantage of the care team and not just the doctor, um, is sort of taking that principle and putting it on steroids in terms of how important it is to make it natural, which is also very important from the consumer experience, right? Because if it feels like some odd appendage to the interaction, you've probably lost the advantage of uh, of making it a seamless experience. So it takes a lot of work, but some, depending on what you're integrating into, sometimes that's an easier or more challenging journey. Anyone else? No. Yes, in the blue. Yeah, so yeah, so our, our current um, mode is we work with payers and providers. Um, what I would tell you is um, on the Medicaid side, the community behavioral health organizations, as part of our relationship, we allow the organizations to offer MyStrength access to the community directly. And so we're trying to, um, and we're currently in 26 states and hopefully we'll continue that progression um, so we're sensitive to the dynamics of what you said in terms of perhaps not having an active relationship with a, a primary care doc. So uh, the way that we're at least trying to diffuse the, the access is through community and county behavioral health organizations to make our resources available within those communities. Well, we've ha we've had some very preliminary conversations with the AARP, a, a number of different advocacy groups. Um, NAMI, I mean, uh, spoke at their national conference last year, and I think there's a lot of interest around how we can kind of think about these these tools and and make them more, more broadly accessible. And I thought I heard another element in your question in terms of how do we promote sharing of information to the provider? You know, there's that limited time slot that you're interacting with PCP and I think there the challenge is creating the right kind of snapshot. First of all, though it's always seemed highly desirable to create a view that the consumer can take, our members can take to their doctor, we've historically found very little uptake in that. We, I mean, we've had personal health records and various things that are, are easy to print and take or send via you know, electronic sort of release system. And there's hardly ever been a lot of uptake there. So sometimes there's a little bit of a disconnect between that sounds like a really good thing to do, but there's less interest when you actually release that capability. That doesn't mean it's a bad you know, thing to keep on working on, but I think the snapshot that's created has to um, be easy, first of all, to generate. And then also going back to the workflow question, 
question fit into the dialogue and the workflow in a way that the provider office can kind of metabolize it. Otherwise, I think it can also become a distraction. So I think there's some art to doing it well uh, that we have to take into account. Yeah, I mean, I, I could talk a lot about that, but I'll, because I, I, I absolutely agree with you, you should have total access to being able to collect that data, use that data. I think there's, the system doesn't allow for it, and that change in the future. But I can tell you the reason why we can't do a direct-to-consumer app, it's, and it's FDA. So as soon as you go direct-to-consumer, there's a whole different level of regulation that applies. And so if we wanted to do that, we would have to become a wellness app, which gets dumbed down um, to the point where it's very hard to go up against other wellness apps. And it's sort of, I mean, so there's a whole FDA reason. That's the reason why we are not doing what you are asking for. However, our intent is there, and we're trying to find partners, like our partnership with MindDoula, which allows the caregiver not only to test themselves, but to test their loved one, and have access to that data, and then have access to the workflow that that data then actually uh, gets, gets looked at, and they can flag it, or their case manager can flag it. We're also working with a sleep clinic, so same with your, you know, when you have your CPAP, you have the app yourself, and you can monitor it. Um, so we're trying to find kind of the balance between the workflow and, and how do you get that information in a meaningful way to your clinical caregiver, but also give you full access to be able to track it as much as you want, just like your blood pressure. You can track your blood pressure. There's no reason you shouldn't be able to track your brain health as well. I think I saw, okay, right here. Um, yeah, we've had some great presentations today on this panel about the research behind uh, the apps that you presented about, but if you, you know, Google or, or, or search for depression apps in like Google Play or over the App Store, you come up with hundreds, if not thousands, of apps. So my question is, how can consumers separate the wheat from the chaff? Right, apps that have some backup versus apps that are just, you know, not validated and have no research behind them that maybe in fact might be harmful. You can't. <laughs> well, but things, but things are emerging. So, so there, I think there's several bodies, whether it's the APA's panel to try to create criteria for evaluating the quality of apps, or CyberGuide, which if I'm not mistaken is a, is a sponsor of this meeting or not. So I think CyberGuide is trying to put some, some standards out. So there's certainly groups both here and in the UK that I know that are trying to put some framework around this and in formal pipeline for evaluation. but. I think that's going to take a while before it's, it's, it's uh, both clear what the pipeline is and whether it's broadly accepted or not. Yeah, I, I would add it, um, it was a purposeful choice for us to go through payers and providers um, because we think it drives engagement, but also legitimacy. So as, as we have been selected by some very large names, we've been um, invasively uh, evaluated on all levels, clinically, from a security perspective, um, even our community and county behavioral health organizations go through a pretty rigorous review of our, our clinical content. And, and so I think um, we believe, uh, along with other apps that are represented here today, I think that, um, at least for us, elevates up a little bit of the evaluation because um, in, in some cases we've had 20 and 30 clinicians spend a couple weeks grinding through our resources to come up with their final evaluation. If you've avoided the FDA, if you're an app that has not gone through the FDA, it means you don't have, you probably don't have the data or the desire or the science to do it. So I would be wary of any app that's making claims in any way that say they're gonna help you with depression or anything like that that are not, that have not gone through that level of, of help. So I don't care what Cyber Guide says about it, and that's a great platform to let people know what's out there, but it's, um, I mean, you have to be really wary. There's a reason why they went for a wellness app and not a clinical app. And every person's different, and just like I might decide to use a Fitbit and you might decide to use an Apple Watch, that's a wellness app, and it's gonna be individual, and it might help you exercise, you know, meditation might help you with depression, but that's gonna be an individual wellness decision, and no one can tell you what app is good for you. Um, 
So I think it's, you really have to be very careful. And these apps are coming out faster than anyone can evaluate them. I, I would, uh, not to end on a controversial note, I, I would push back on that a little bit. I don't, I don't think going through the FDA affords you the gold standard. I think no, there, there uh, are- No, agreed, there but are, you have to are, be wary. There, why, there, why didn't they? Understood. Why didn't they? Why the didn't they? Purposeful decisions yeah. around a business model. Um, there are many um, digital mental health apps that have an inordinate body of research. Uh, and, and we'd be included in that sure, category. Sure. So I, I, I don't think it's a fair um, observation to say unless a depression app has gone through FDA approval that, that it should be considered um, you know, the, the top tier. I, I think there's a, um, there's a number of organizations that have collected a tremendous amount of data. There's been 150 randomized controlled trials done on online cognitive behavioral therapy well-validated, well-tested. Right, and none of them are going direct to consumer. They're doing what you're doing. They're going through legitimate tracks, I would argue. But again, I mean, I think it's good to have a little controversy. <laughs> so I just got the three-minute warning sign, and I know there's one more question back here, so let's do it. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a few things that I think hit at that. I mean, one would be we have health risk assessments that are built into um, our, our web tools for our members and things like that. So they would include, you know, checking in really from a broad well-being perspective, physical, mental, cognitive, emotional, substance use, et cetera. And then we heavily promote uh, people going for their annual wellness exam which is you know, obviously the place where uh, we'd like to see that full, um, full checkup that gets at cognitive functioning, et cetera. So between tools that the consumer can pull up at any time and then hopefully having a PCP, having that relationship, uh, hopefully those two get at some of what you're driving at. Yes. I mean, well, it's a supposed to be. Yes. <laughs> a good I mean, visit, yes. Yeah. And we do encourage through uh, different reimbursement codes, different things for primary care doctors to do that screening. There's a whole acronym around it, screening, brief interventions, referrals into treatment. And so um, it's a really important domain of a primary care checkup because, you know, 70 to 80% of mental health presents in the primary care office. So um, we, have to, we do a lot to increase the skills and comfort of primary care to have the capacity and the tools to address those dimensions of health. Agree. Well, the waiting room time is perfect time for a lot of those assessments. So there are, depending on the practice and the payer and what's been rolled out in a community, but yes, those models are definitely in play. Great. I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, I mean, so for us, for Anthem, right, we, you know, obviously are partnering with MyStrength, but in different provider offices, it could be different arrangements as well. So the most important thing is obviously that the assessment is happening, 
um, more so than you know via which tool, which app, because the tools, the screening tools are evidence-based screening tools that have been validated, and as long as they're included, I think the doctor will have the right information available. So we are out of time, but I think this has been a fabulous panel. Each speaker has presented some wonderful information. I look forward to thinking about the future, and you know, I'm, I'm glad we're not using the backpacks as telephones now, and I can only <laughs> imagine if we have this panel again, probably in, what, a year or two, we'll be thinking, wow, this is, you know, what we were talking about two years ago is so outdated. So if you'll join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.